Welcome to the Assistant Room Podcast Season 2. We are the go-to online community for assistants around the world. And if you're looking for some serious career inspiration from some of the best and brightest executive assistants, you're in the right place. If we haven't met before, or if you're just joining us, I'm Jessica Gardner, founder of award-winning PAEA membership platform, The Assistant Room. Make sure you hit the follow button to keep up to date with all of our future episodes. But without further ado, welcome to season two of The Assistant Room podcast. In this episode, I speak to Kat Bromley, EA to Chief Product Officer at Gymshark. Together, Kat and I discuss how to continuously push yourself out of your comfort zone and embrace opportunities outside of your role as an EA, the importance of having a boss who champions you to try new things, how to navigate an identity crisis and dispel the stigma around mental health as an assistant, and what being a strategic thinker is and how she uses that skill on a daily basis. Welcome, Kat. I'm so excited to have you here. You're last. Se- you're the last guest of season two. I feel like that's a lot of pressure. It's no pressure. No pressure. No <laughs> pressure. No pressure. We're just here to talk all about you. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, we were just having a really good chat about everything that you've been doing yeah. throughout your career. Yeah. And I'm going to rephrase question one in the same way that you said it a moment ago, how the hell did you get to where you are at the minute? Um, you know, 2002 is your first PA role. Yeah. And we're now 2022, yeah, which is wanna, quite I bizarre. I don't want to think about how long that is. That's a really long time <laughs> to be an expert though. Now at what you're doing right. is where you are. Hopefully. <laughs> so tell us, how, how the hell did you get to where you are? I mean, I didn't, I don't think it's unusual, but I didn't start in a traditional way at all. I didn't start as a PA. Um, I fell into it, I think is probably the easiest way to say it. So I left school and I didn't know what to do. So I covered all bases. I applied for my A-levels, I applied for a BTEC. I applied for an apprenticeship. I actually applied, applied for either four or five companies and I can't quite remember, but I applied for an apprenticeship in mechanical engineering, which is so far removed from what I do now that it's bizarre. Um, but I applied to car manufacturers. So I'm from the Midlands, which you can probably hear from my accent. Um, and car, the car industry was huge. And we had LDV vans where I ended up working um, to like skip forward, give you a bit of a teaser. Um, BMW were there, Jaguar Land Rover, obviously still there. Rover no longer exists, but was there. Um, and Peugeot, all of those manufacturers were there. I applied to all of them for the same um, apprenticeship and I got the role with LDV Vans. I was the only girl. I came from an all girls school to the most male dominated environment I'd ever been in. And um, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. The first year was gonna be full time at college to sort of learn on the job and I got paid. It was like a win-win, learning, getting paid, great. So I think it's six months in, but I was just saying to you, I think it might've been four months in. I might be kidding myself about how long it was. I got made redundant because the car industry collapsed in Birmingham. I think it collapsed in a lot of places, but my world was Birmingham. And um, I got made redundant. I didn't even know what that meant. So <laughs> I, that. I was 17 and just was like, okay, no worries. So I don't have a job now. So next, what do I do? And the short story is that my dad just didn't let me stay at home, not doing anything. So he just went, you need to get a job. So I tapped into what we would now call networking, but I wasn't that sophisticated. I spoke to family friends and I was like, I need a job. Does anybody know of any jobs going, any, like, any family businesses or anything? And one of our family friends said, my accountancy firm is hiring um, for an office junior. So if you want that job, it's eight grand a year. Go, eight go do it. Eight grand a year. <laughs> and I thought- Did you think you were rolling in it? I did, I was like, <laughs> oh my God extra money because I wasn't being paid that doing the apprenticeship and um I went and did it and I learned from the ground up and I got taken under the wing of the practice manager and she was she had a PA background she taught me all she knew and I learned everything from like inputting timesheets for all the accountants which was the most mundane Friday job it was awful but kind of got used to doing mundane things which is quite important um and giving the post out and reading really confidential stuff and not being able to say anything about it and everything. So I, I kind of worked there and they had a, 
a, what we would now call a tech arm, but it was their IT support sort of arm. And um, there were two directors running that, and then they split from the accountancy practice, and I went with them. So I got them. I was my first PA job. I was PA to two directors. And then we moved offices, moved out into our own offices. So I got office manager added to the title as well. Wow. And I was like, okay, this is a bit wild. I'm 18, I've got two directors. And it was just like thrown in at the deep end. So that was how I kind of landed in that role. And I did that for quite a while. Um, and learned everything from that role that because it was a small company, it gave me the best foundations. And I learned how to write a set of management accounts, how to read a PL, how to deal with people that owed us money and having difficult conversations on the phone saying you owe us we need to be paid um and really important experience yeah huge it was really it was and, and it really, was really grown good. up experience considering yeah. you were so young as yeah. well it was I don't think I realized it at the time because you yeah. just kind of crack on don't yeah you? but um yeah it was definitely very very grown up and thinking back on it I don't know how I did it to be honest but I think I, I learned a lot from that role because my two directors, one was technical, one was an accountant. So mm -hmm. I had two very different humans to look after and they both taught me different things. So if a customer phoned, I wouldn't just go, oh, okay, I'll pass you on. I'd pick the phone up and then I'd go, do you know what? This is annoying just passing them on. If there's like a, a consistent technical issue, can you just teach me how to fix this? Because yeah. what you do on the phone, I reckon I could do that. So our directors would then teach me how to answer the phone and do, I mean, I'd be shocked for saying this, but you know, basic coding, it clearly wasn't, but I'd like talk them through what to type into a command window to fix a problem on their server or something crazy. I mean, it was wild. So we did that and then kind of learned how to do payroll and all those kind of things that you do in a small business, you just kind of all pitch in. And um, so I did that for quite a while, grew quite a lot in that role and learned a lot. And um, we then had an admin assistant, so I sort of imparted a bit of knowledge to her and um, it felt nice to be the one telling somebody else how to, how to do something. It felt quite good. So I got to a point where I was like, okay, so it's a small business. It's under 10 people. And I wanted to do a bit more and I wanted a bit more experience. And I'd had a few years in that role and I was like, maybe work for a bigger business. So I looked and I found a temporary role, um, with big lottery fund. So I went and worked for them on a contract and it was uh, an ops support role. It wasn't a PA role. So I'd gone from kind of knowing everything to looking after travel, basically, for a company. Big difference. Huge difference. Yeah. And a bit of a a bit of a come down from that kind of knowing all the things to you look after this little bit of the business and you support this huge company. And um, I'd never booked international travel before. So I'd, never, I'd actually never flown at this point. I'd never been on a plane and so I didn't know how to book international travel. So I learned that there and um, Big Lottery Fund, they, I think they're called something completely different now, but they basically decide where grants for the lottery go and okay. they assess those cases and then they, they kind of give the money to worthy causes. So there's a lot of trips abroad because it's not just UK, it's worldwide. So I had to learn visas I had to learn international flights the connections the time you'd need at an airport having never done this as well having so never been in that position constantly learning constantly yeah. learning. so in your previous role you learn tons of operational and commercial things and now you're in the the travel yeah environment yeah it must have been really scary booking travel for the first time I can't remember doing it but the idea of having someone's whole trip with their visas and everything that's down to you yeah it seems quite scary it's scary when you've done it as well when you've actually been the person getting on the plane and going and knowing the implication if you don't have the paperwork when you get there you understand the severity of it but if you've never traveled you've never been on a plane you don't know so oh it's ending them to like Cambodia and you don't know what visa they need to get in there and you think I think I've done all the paperwork I think I've got the right time between the connections I think their bags are going straight through I didn't know bags going straight through was a thing that was a trip that was a tricky lesson. <laughs> not not very fun. My luggage isn't here. Okay, didn't know it had to be checked all the way through. This is awkward. That's a horrible lesson to learn. Um, yeah, just just a different world. And I wasn't working at the top of the business, so I didn't have all the kind of sight of everything. I just had this one little section that I saw and kind of did my job every day. And um, we moved offices in amongst that, and there was a. a a lady that was running that kind of project for the for the company 
And I kind of buddied up with her and I was just kind of like shadowing her and just watching her. Just wanted to learn how you move an office. So we moved from one side of Birmingham to another into a huge office. We'd gone from sort of one floor to four floors of a huge building. Um, and we had swipes on the door. I'd never had that before. That was quite exciting <laughs> to go from like little companies that didn't have anything. It was just, you know, you walked in and out to, it was very official. You had like actual security on reception and things like that. <laughs> it was just, again, a bit of a growing up experience. So it went from there. That was a, that was a contract. So as that was coming to an end, went back to an agency and was like, I need a job. I need, I kind of, this is my background. So I got, um, put forward for a role with a construction company to look after, to be PA and office manager to the regional director of a national construction company. And I got the role. And I remember driving away from the interview thinking, nailed that. And, and then you I got did. the call. I got the call on the way home. So I literally, I pulled out of the drive and um, I, I did think that went really well. I think, I think I might've got in there, but I'm driving along having a bit of doubt thinking, Maybe I'm being a bit too sure of myself here. Maybe I didn't get it. And it was five minutes. I get a phone call from the agency. They want to offer you the, the job. And I was like, it's been five minutes. What on earth? It been really a did go well. Huge confidence boost. It was amazing. I felt so, so good because this was the first time I'd got a PA role that I hadn't accidentally fallen into. <laughs> I'd actually earned my place a little bit. So... I started there, loved it, absolutely loved it. It was in the middle of the countryside. It, our lunches were like on picnic benches outside with the fresh air. It was just the dream. And it was an amazing company. And suddenly I'm in a role that is so fast paced, I have not got time to breathe. And it was my first real experience. I'd worked fast before, but this was next level. And the risk to getting things wrong was so huge. So if you got a drawing revision wrong on a 20 million pound build, that is not going to go well. That's giving me yeah, like anxiety, anxiety just thinking about it. All the responsibility of these drawings. Um, and this might be a bit apparent by now. I'm a sucker for learning things. I love learning things. So I learned the construction industry. I learned project management there. I shadowed the project managers and the contracts managers. I went to site. I learned how the site managers worked, how the construction teams all connected in. And because they were a principal contractor, I learned how the subcontractors reported into the principal contractor and how that all worked. So I just was like a sponge. But none of those parts of the job were actually my job, but I loved it. And I was like, I wanna know, I wanna know how this works. And I had a really supportive boss and I, um, I was just lucky. I just was in an amazing environment and learned an awful lot. Um, on top of that, I kind of learned skills that I think I never would have picked up as a PA. So I learned how to use Gantt charts, which no one really teaches you how to use that. Um, and that proved really useful further down my career as well, which we'll get on to. Um, but yeah, so I did that role. Um, I had an amazing team around me. And then I was on holiday about two and a half, three years into the role. The business had been going great. And it was Why too, do I have this feeling? Yeah, sinking feeling, sinking feeling. Keep, keep that sinking feeling, you're right. So it was 2008, which gives you a hint of what's about to come. Um, and I'm on holiday, I'm at Dallas airport, and I can remember exactly where I stood. And my phone rings, and it's our assistant at the office. And she said, I didn't want to call you, but I need to call you. We're closing the office and our roles are gone because the construction industry was one of the first to be hit in the mm. recession. And suddenly it was all just very real. And I was like, oh my God, I'm getting shivers now thinking about I'm it. I'm getting shivers too. I, it was, I loved that job so much. And we had such a good team and we worked so hard and we did some amazing things. Um, we built some incredible, We they, they specialize in car dealerships and we built some amazing car dealerships and we had launch parties for them. And, and suddenly it was just gone. It was just all gone. And they had three offices and they were closing the one in the middle. They had one up north, one down south and one in the middle and they closed us. And it was the right thing to do for the business. And that business kept going. Um, and at the time I was so, so sad, but I also understood it wasn't personal. There was no ounce of me that was angry. I was just like, oh, I'm not gonna see my friends every day. I'm not gonna see this amazing team that we built together. We're not gonna see each other anymore. And we're all gonna have to split off and do our own things. 
and it just felt so sad so so sad so i got back to the uk and um straight on the phone to an agency i was like i'm available <laughs> and luckily back then the job market was amazing i don't know quite why because the recession had started to impact people but it was amazing and um i got a call back to go and do a completely different role and it was one of those conversations with the agency where i was like that's not what i do though that's not my job i'm a pa and they were like you have got transferable skills though and you've got sort of the groundworks because i'd done a pa and office manager role for such a long time in different industries i'd got a bit of a, a basis i understood payroll i understood hr i understood sort of personnel issues I understood how to look after an office, how to do facilities management, how to do car, like vehicle management. I could do it, but I sort of didn't know that I could do it because it's just part of your job. You don't list it out or you just kind of do it. So um, I got this role to be um, personnel and administration manager for a recycling company nearby. And I was like, I can't do this job. I'm not a manager. What the hell? I'm a, I'm an assistant. This isn't, this isn't what I do. So I had this huge doubt that I could do this but they were so behind me and, and I'm I still talk to the lady who put me forward now, back then I still talk to her now because she was so she was pushing me so hard to do this that and she believed in me so much I was like you're amazing you pushed me into that and I would never have had the confidence to do that so I did it and um unfortunately <laughs> within about nine months recession hit them because they had dealings with China at the pound, like, oh, cap. I'm going to say the pound dropped. I've got to be honest. I don't really know which way it went, but basically our trading deals with China impacted the business so much. They had to make cuts and I, I was made redundant. So <laughs> second time in within a year. So I was like, oh, this is great. Wonderful. Okay, fine. So I, I actually stayed on and um, and wrapped up. I was one of the only ones that stayed through their notice rather than just going. Um, I wrapped up, I kind of helped with payroll. I was just very professional because I thought it, it's not personal. This is not about me. This is the business. It needs to survive and I'm gonna be fine. I'm gonna find another job. So I did when I found another job and um, I then moved. So I moved a hundred miles away and had to find yet another job. So I kind of skipped from Birmingham to Northampton and got a job as a PA, an office manager back in the construction industry, which was starting to pick up again. So I was back where I knew, I felt comfortable. Mm. I was like, this is, this is my thing. I think I'm just gonna always be in construction. I'd got a bit of a bug for it. Um, and that role was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. I worked for two owners of the business, um, I still have contact with them now. Like they, they're lovely that's human beings. Lovely. I think that's really important. I think when, whenever I've, I've left somewhere, I've tried to leave on good terms because you never, you never know when you're going to come across someone again. Um, and also, it's just nice. It just feels nice to leave on good terms if you can. I think you should. Um, so, I, I worked there. I actually left there at least once and came back. I feel like it might have been twice, but I, I basically needed different hours several years into the role. So I left, I left at one point because I, I sort of proposed fewer hours to them and they were like, it's just not going to work. And in my heart, I knew it couldn't mm. work. I, I couldn't give them what they needed in four days or three days. It needed to be that full-time role. So I left and then um, I got a phone call a couple of months later and they were like, can you come back? You can do those three days. <laughs> So I went back and I did three days and I made it work and I worked really hard on those days. And, um, it, it was, it was amazing. It was an amazing role. Did you find very quickly before we move on, did you yeah. find that to make that work and condense it from five days a week to three days? Do you, can you think of any kind of key skills that you really pulled on to make sure that that relationship worked as well in three days as it would have done in five days? I think, the key for me was on a Thursday. So I, I worked the middle part of the week, Tuesday to Thursday. I think the key for me was on a Thursday, I didn't leave until things were wrapped up. And I made sure that there was a real clear handover to my bosses because there wasn't anyone doing those other two days for me. Um, 
I think that was that was one. And I think the second one was I just said that I am available. I can put my phone up. I'm not like completely unavailable in those times. They never actually called me in those two days off, which speaks volumes for how respectful that relationship was. And the world didn't end. It was all fine. I I'm, I just tried to be considerate of the fact that I wasn't going to be in for four days. And what would happen in those four days? I needed to make sure they're pre prepared for the Friday and the Monday and that they were prepared for the Tuesday as well. Because if I came in, I couldn't just be scrambling around trying to get them ready for their day. Um, and quite a lot of their job was traveling to site as well. So just kind of making sure they were kind of wrapped up. But I think a mutual respect and, and honesty, just honesty with each other. Like, what do you need? That conversation between you and your boss is so important. And what do you need? You, you don't have all the answers. You're not going to. So unless you communicate, you're not going to know. Um, and I think that made it easier. So that really worked for us, um, which was great. And then I went from there and I moved into a private role and had a lot of projects to do and a lot of I had to learn very quickly how to do things that were very impossible that like <laughs> make the I, I there's a phrase that one of my um, amazing EAs where I now work says quite a lot which is you make the impossible possible but also so much of what we do the best work that we do is the work that no one sees because it's just the nature of the job and that's kind of what you need to do to succeed so I think in that role I had to learn very quickly I had to learn things I'd never come across before um I didn't know how a swimming pool worked. I didn't know the filtration systems. Had to learn them, had to figure it out. Um, so there's a lot of YouTube video watching and a lot of Googling and figuring it out as you go along. There's no other way of doing it, asking a lot of questions. It's called being resourceful. Resourceful. Um, I always felt like che it was cheating at school, right? To look at like a calculator or look it up on the internet. But now you're just like, well, that's how you do your job. Ooh, so yeah, exactly. how else you can do it? Um, Initiative and resourcefulness. <laughs> the two best qualities yeah. of a PA. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I did that role for quite a while. And then I went to Selfridges. So that was a, a big change. And um, I wasn't expecting that role, to be quite honest. It came out of the blue. So um, I, was, I was looking for a job and I reached out to somebody that I knew at Selfridges who was very senior and I knew them through a different avenue and just said, look, you're really well connected in Birmingham. And I'm thinking of moving back to Birmingham. And do you know of anyone that's looking to hire a PA or an office manager or anything? Now, she didn't actually know me professionally. She didn't know my world. And she came back and said, I can't believe that this has happened, but it was something like three days before her assistant had handed her notice in and was on four weeks notice. And she was like, do you want to come in for a chat? And I was like, uh, Perfect sure. timing. What the hell? It's like this the stars have aligned it was almost. Crazy. But you know, when you're like, I don't want to get my hopes up because this might mm. not work. And what if it's not the right thing? So I was sort of like cautiously excited, <laughs> but I went and had a chat, met with the recruitment team and and it worked out and I got the job and I started within sort of three weeks or something. It was really quick and had a handover with the assistant that was in the role at the time. And then it was, I was just thrown in. I was just like, go for it. I Good had, luck. I, <laughs> it was so, um, it was so insane. It was so insane in a good way. It was amazing. Um, it is literally the most exciting place to work. It's, so fast and so magical and so full of experience. They the focus on the customer experience is so huge that you can't help but get swept up in it. And you just, it's so exciting. Um, so I, I went and worked there and um, I looked after the general manager and just loved it. Just absolutely loved it. Went to work every day, happy as anything. My journey to and from work was horrendous because I didn't live near the store. You were I was far, commuting I was from Northampton to into, London, weren't you? Into Birmingham at that point. I went to Birmingham. So I was in the Birmingham store and every single day and my team were there and I learned tons very, very fast. And 
the world of retail is not like anything else. It was such a shock. I, I really went in there thinking, okay, I can do a PA role. I know I can do that. Can I do it in retail? I don't know. I don't know this world. So I learned that I could, but my God, it's fast. It just everything, every decision and every, every meeting, it's like bouncing from one to the other. Um, and my boss taught me a lot and the team of the senior team around me taught me a lot. And I became really kind of to, I don't know. I mean, it, it kind of became my whole world and I love being there. I'd leave super early in the morning to get there early, partly to miss the traffic, but also because I really loved it. I didn't, I didn't want to get in late. I didn't want to kind of skid in the door at half eight or whatever. So I'd be there at kind of between seven and 7.30 and then I'd work my day. And if I had down moments, I'd be on the shop floor and just milling about and, you know, kind of interacting with customers and saying, hey, do you know where you're going? And it gave me a little buzz and it was just a nice part of the day. Um, and there was loads of excitement. There was always a new brand coming in or, you know, activations in the store and it was just so fun. So um, I worked there for three years, changed role during that time, and then ended up where I am now, which is a completely different company, and back as an EA. Amazing. Do you know what I think, listening to you talk about your entire career so far, everyone watching this and listening to this, I think is gonna think the same. You just love what you do. Yeah. I don't think I've ever met somebody who consistently sort of inserts themselves in the, in the business that they work for as much as you do. Like you've just yeah. said about how you learn all these different things and when you were on site, you learned everything about the contractors and the subcontractors. And when you were at Selfridges, you would speak to the customers. <laughs> like you can just go and walk around on the shop floor. I yeah. think that's amazing. So many people just, there's that phrase quiet quitting, isn't there at the moment yeah. that everyone's yeah. talking about. I can never imagine you would be a quiet quitter. No, <laughs> no, no, never. No, I can remember um, when when I was working in Northampton, it was a it was a construction business, but it was a metal workers. It's not glam at all. Not in the rem most remote part of my brain was that glam. Um, but I used to there was like a viewing platform because it was there were welding in the factory. The factory was attached to the offices. The offices were attached to the factory more like. Um, and I used to go on the viewing platform and just watch what they were doing. And I, I wanted to know because my, if I rewind back to my first ever job, I used to weld. So I could do that as well. And I would just watch and I'd be like, we get this raw, dirty steel coming in the back of the factory. <laughs> and then this amazing staircase would come out and go into some beautiful house. And you'd just be like, we made that. And then I got to a point where I'd be really nerdy and go, we, we made that. So I would see something on TV. Oh yeah, we made that. We made those balustrades. I, <laughs> Not I com exciting at all. I completely get this though, because my dad's a steel fabricator. Oh my God. And it's so bizarre. All my friends think I'm really weird because anything steel or anything metal, like an oil rig, I'm yeah. just like, oh my God, this is amazing. Is, and watching amazing. him transform things. <laughs> we it's so nerdy. I'll invite you down to his workshop. I'll come, I'll come. <laughs> I mean, I'm up for that. Um, okay, well, what does it take to work in a fast paced environment? We've spoken about this. Yeah. You've done so many different things. You've gone from industry to industry, but yeah. obviously you're you're still working in a very, you know, fast paced environment. You've worked in a fast paced environment at Selfridges. What does it actually take to make that work for you? A little bit of resilience, because sometimes that can get tough. Um, the ability to know when, when you get home, when you need to, take a minute for yourself because you're no good at work if you're not taking care of yourself mm. and I think that is probably the one thing that I was really bad at at one point very very bad at um because it's easy to just let it take over your world because you care you love it you don't you don't do you certainly wouldn't do this job if you didn't love it because it's not easy it's it can be hard it's very very rewarding though and I think that's the you do it for the love, you do it for the reward of, you're making someone's life better, happier, you improve processes, whatever whatever it is that, that's your thing. Um, but I think definitely resilience. And I think 
shouting up when you can't keep pace. If something's going too fast, you are not a robot. You're not hired to be a robot. You're not hired to remember everything like Siri, you aren't. <laughs> and I think it's really easy to then beat yourself up and say, oh my God, I forgot that meeting or I forgot to put that in the diary or I forgot to book a train or I didn't book a meeting room and now they're scrambling because they've got nowhere to go. It's very easy to then beat yourself up about those little things. But actually, that's the nature of a fast paced business. And I think the the ability to react quickly, I think most EAs have that and PAs, they have that ability. You just kind of have to tap into it a little bit. And sometimes I think we doubt ourselves because we're supporting a human or humans and you aren't front and center. You forget you're really capable. You actually can do this. Put your mind to it. You really can, can do this. Um, a bit of self-belief, I think, is so important um, because you you do have to kind of keep going. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Growing on the idea of, or building on the idea of self-belief, another common theme throughout your entire career so far is pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Like you've spoken to us about how you did the kind of corporate office-y roles and then you went into more of a private role and the swimming pool and I know that you've done home renovations before. Yeah. How do you constantly push yourself out of your comfort zone? I think for me, I like the change and I, I kind of, I think naturally we're quite curious as creatures. But I'm probably I probably push that a bit further, and I I am curious. I'm extremely nosy, which makes you a very good assistant. If you're very nosy, you know all the things. Um, but because I'm very nosy, I then kind of I want to know things. Then when you learn a thing, you might love that thing. So I, I refer back to construction quite a lot because it it factors in my career further down, which we'll touch on. But I got a little bit addicted to it because it is magical. Construction is quite a unique environment. It's very unforgiving, it's very fast, it's very demanding. And when you push yourself out of your comfort zone, you you never know what might happen. So if you just say no and stay in your lane, stay in your comfort zone, you absolutely can. And I know, I know career PAs that have done that and actually there's nothing wrong with that. But for me personally, I'm just itching. I'm itching to learn, I'm itching to know more. I want to be absorbed in what I do who I work for the industry the department whatever and the that want and need to push myself it makes me better I think and if I know I think that the way it kind of started for me was I realized very early on at, at my first ever PA role if I knew the technical aspect of what a customer was calling for I was much more effective for my directors they didn't have to take that call. They could carry on working. They weren't interrupted. And I was then making their time more useful. So I think it kind of started with that. And then as you go on, you realize actually you're just pushing yourself and you're just learning more and you're pushing yourself out of your comfort zone to, to know more things, to learn how to do payroll, to learn how to read a PL, to learn how steel gets turned from that into that, you know, all those things. Um, and I think I've always been really lucky in the roles that I've had where my bosses have really encouraged that. They've encouraged me to be passionate because if they see my passion, that makes them proud as well. I've, yeah. I, I've had bosses that have sort of gone, you really do care. You, you've taken a lot of time to learn this and to understand our industry and, and what our challenges are. Um, and I think it just makes you a better EA. Absolutely. Curiosity <laughs> is one of the most consistent I think skills that I see amongst the best executive assistants yeah. in our industry regardless of what sector you're in yeah um but kind of growing on or building on again you know the idea that you have a supportive boss if we go back to Selfridges you transitioned internally within the organization yeah. at one point from EA was it to project manager yeah yeah, yeah. And, and your boss was the person who was really encouraging you to do that yeah she she was the one that that I mean she could have shoved me into it she would have done <laughs> she was <laughs> yeah. so supportive so it, it wasn't a role that I applied for I it was presented to me by my boss um she I remember she took me into her office and I thought oh no what have I forgotten <laughs> what have I done wrong um and she was like so how do you feel about doing us a comment and I was like but 
I love my job. What are you, are you trying to get rid of me? What does this mean? And basically there was an opportunity that um, there was a project, a property project manager role within the Birmingham store to help the um, the team, the, the sort of London based team to run a major renovation on the outside of the store. Now it came at a really handy time because it was COVID so they couldn't travel. And I was based in Birmingham. So I kind of, I'd, one of the biggest things in my career that I think has helped me is relationships. And I, I am a firm believer in that you cannot get your job done unless you make amazing relationships with everyone. Everyone from top of the organization down to the bottom. And they have to be really real and they can't be fake. They can't be relationships that are just convenience. They have to be genuine. And because of that, I didn't mind who I talked to. I didn't mind if I talked to the exec team at Selfridges when they came to visit or the director of property or his team or any of that. And I had done and I'd I'd made myself known to them with no intention other than I just wanted to do a good job as a PA. But what I hadn't realized was that I'd actually got noticed for that. And I had dropped into conversation that I had a construction background, but not that I had never said that I was a project manager. That was never a conversation. And basically the head of retail projects and the director of property wanted me to do that role as a secondment under their guidance to do this enormous renovation. I mean, huge compliment, huge compliment. You'd think I'd just be like, yep, I'm off. But I wasn't, <laughs> I was like, I can't do that. That's huge. I can't, I'm not qualified to do that. What are you talking about? Um, and I just suddenly had this enormous doubt and just like, I'm scared to step out of my lane. It was the first time in my life I'd sort of gone, this, this is too much, it's too much. I'm happy here, can I just stay? And I had this like wobble where I was like, I'm not sure I can do it. And my boss was the most supportive. She, she, we knew each other very well because we'd got, we'd got a, a relationship prior to me joining Selfridges anyway. And then when I worked for her, I'd had two years working with her and she knew me very well. She knew what, where my kind of weak points were. And the self doubt thing was there and she knew it was temporary. She knew if she gave me a shove, I'd just do it and I'd be fine. And she was right. I did it and I was fine. And I, I threw myself into it and I had a new boss and I reported to the head office and I dealt with contractors every day. And I had to have difficult conversations with contractors every day. And I'd gone from being the person that you meet when you first come into the building and come into the management office to not being that person anymore and being the person that had to have tricky conversations. So I wasn't like the, good morning, how are you, happy? Like the swan that's calm on the outside no matter what is going on underneath and, you know, being the picture of professionalism at the desk to, no, that's that's not acceptable, that timeline won't work. And those tricky conversations. And I, initially I was like, oh, this feels so out of my comfort zone. I don't like this. But I had not only my previous boss when I was PA behind me all the way because I was looking after her store. I was looking after that kind of how that looked to the customer. And I, I really cared about the customer journey. That's It's really, um, it's one of the things that Selfridge I think that is so magical is that the customer comes first. So everything you do, you then think, how's the customer going to see this? How does this, how does this look to them? How is their journey going to be impacted? Or, you know, is, are they going to be happy to see this or not happy to see, you know, that kind of thing. This project was so visible, there was no hiding it. We shielded the entire Birmingham store, which is one of the most iconic stores in the world. It's on like a Microsoft screensaver or something. It's so, it's so iconic. And we shielded it with scaffolding and wrapped it in this huge pink wrap to renovate it. And I was on site every day and that was my project. And I had the most amazing new boss that supported me in that and guided me and taught me things. And I learned some really tough lessons in that role, really tough, because then suddenly I was responsible. I wasn't the support act anymore. And it was quite a shock to the system, <laughs> but I learned some lessons there that I've taken into life, my new role, everything, like so powerful. And without the support of my boss to start with, 
I would never have done it. I would never have even applied if it had been available. And I would never have ended up kind of where I am now. It, it all kind of led to where I am today. I wish more bosses were like your old boss. Yeah. The amount of PAs and EAs that I speak to who say, I've got this amazing skill set. You know, say for example, I had a conversation with, I think I've mentioned her on this podcast in this season before, but I had one PA say, I've joined this company, I think it's a bank, and I've explained to my boss that my skill set is people. And I've asked if I can go on the next client day that we have, which was like a, a day on the golf course. Yeah. And her boss said, no, you can't do that. And she asked why, and she said, because you're my PA. You need to be in the office. Mm -hmm. And I think that as an industry, we have to, whether it's working for people who are very supportive and understanding what the limitations are within a role before you take them up, or understanding, okay, can I, what are my skills? What are my strengths? And how can I, you know, include that in a role? And maybe can you suggest things to kind of, build out the scope of what you do. I think we need to start doing that more. Yeah, I, th I, th I think you're right. I, for, for me, I, I don't think I was ever looking for it. Yeah. Um, but I, I do know, you know, I have quite a broad range of um, PAs and EAs I've met over the years I've, I've kept in touch with and I'm really close to. And some of them want career development within their role. And I've seen good and bad in that. And some are su really supported and some are really not supported. And I think it's a real shame when they're not because ultimately if, it, it, and it's true of any industry and true of any role, if you're not supporting your person that reports to you in their career development, they won't stay anyway. Mm. So what's the negative? And I think that's quite important, but. Um, it's what yeah. we always say when, um, any corporate organization or any PA who wants to get their corporate organization to pay for like the, the assistant and membership internally and their boss turns around and says, no, we haven't got budget for 250 pounds per person per year. My automatic response is always, do you know how much it would cost to replace you? Mm. Which will happen if you don't feel valued and if you don't feel looked after by your organization because that 250 pounds in some businesses stick three zeros on the end of it. That's how much it costs some organizations mm. to replace you just in an agency fee. That doesn't include the time spent on training someone new up. That doesn't t you know, take into consideration the time it takes for you as a new person to get to know the exec and get to know yeah. everything. Yeah. So it is, it is difficult, but let, yeah. let's stick to Selfridges. Yeah. Supportive yeah is i think when we've spoken probably the 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 biggest word i would use to describe your experience at selfridges yeah. whether that came from bringing you on board pushing you outside your comfort zone giving you this new opportunity as a project manager but you also had quite a difficult time in your personal life when you were at selfridges and they really supported you through that and you were able to talk about mental health and you were able to be i suppose vulnerable within yeah. at Selfridges. Yeah, I definitely was. And I, I, I didn't intend to be. <laughs> I think I, I, I'm one of, I almost feel like it's a little bit old school to say I tried to keep my personal life and my professional life very separate. Um, and it came to a point in Selfridges where they just collided and I didn't intend it. Um, and I, I went through a really tough time and I ended up needing to take time away from the business. And it was about nine months into my role and it took me by surprise. I think it definitely took my bosses by surprise. So um, I was very nervous about opening up about it with them and I I didn't know how it would land. And I don't know why I was ever worried because that company is so sort of, they surround you with so much support and they're so, there's a, there's a phrase that is used, which is, everyone is welcome. And that's for customers, obviously. That's a Harry Gordon Selfridge statement. Everyone is welcome. It's one of his mottos. And, um, but it's true behind the scenes too. And it was, it's that kind of acceptance of everything that comes with life is okay here. You're gonna be okay here. You're gonna be supported here. And I I took something between, between four and six weeks off. 
and um, was fairly well I was very uncomfortable I couldn't I couldn't communicate with the business it wasn't connected to the business which was great in a way um, but I needed to step back so when I came back to the business I um, was just so supported so so supported I love this it, it was amazing it, it kind of gives me all the feels to be honest because I I was very vulnerable when I came back I was I'd been through a lot and I was visibly, I looked very different. I'd lost a lot of weight in that period of time as well. And when someone's off, if they don't come back with a plaster cast on their leg after four or six weeks, they were off because of their mental health. So I think it was pretty obvious. And I was a little bit nervous about how that would be when I came back because I was very visible in the office and I was very, um, my desk was literally at the entrance to the management suite. So everybody would see me every single day and talk to me every single day. So it was obvious you weren't there. Very obvious. And I was highly aware of that. Um, so I went back and I was on a phased return. I went and had my return to work with my boss on the day, on the first day back. And I just went in her office and just cried with relief that I was back. And I was so desperate to get back and have normality and have a bit of routine and get back to the thing that made me really happy and gave me actual joy, which was doing my job. And it had become a little bit, it had become my identity as a coping mechanism. So when I came back, I, I'd i been very honest. My bosses knew why I was off and um, they were just amazing. And other people in the office, I, I remember one particular person, one of the managers came to me on the day I returned and all I kept hearing was the same phrase. We're so glad to see you back. We hope you're okay. That was it. No intrusion, no questions. They didn't want to know anything. No one was like, so uh been off for a while there was none of that because it just wasn't the thing in that industry it's it's not i don't know whether it's an industry thing actually i think it, it's definitely a selfridges thing but i um i had a hug from one of the well-being ambassadors and i just bawled <laughs> um and she was just like if you need anything if you need to talk if you need time come find me and it was just so lovely to have that i i don't think i could have had asked for a better experience for such a horrible experience to then come back to where I felt so loved and so cared for, I couldn't have asked for more than that. It was amazing. Do you think that having gone through that, do you think that there is any connection between PAs and EAs admitting that they are struggling with something and imposter syndrome and thinking, you know, deep down, you know, that phrase, just a PA or, or whatever, a lot of people think <laughs> that being just a PA means, which as we all know, yeah. that's not even mildly accurate. <laughs> Do you think that there's any connection between not feeling good enough because we're not treated necessarily how we want to be treated? And then you think, oh, I can't admit that I'm struggling at work because that is going to kind of, cement this idea that I'm not good enough almost. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I don't, I don't know whether... I, I don't, don't necessarily think it's because we... we no, I don't think anyone thinks that they're not good enough, but it's that, that confidence issue, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. I think my experience was a little bit different in, in a way, but I can, I can definitely see how that happens. For me, I... It wasn't so much the, well, I suppose it was it was admitting. That was quite tricky. But I think there's a, I've definitely got this old school mentality of keeping work and private separate and not trying not to bring my private life into work. Now, there is a caveat to that because I do also believe you need to be genuinely you at work. So there is a part of it that contradicts that. But for me, I, I was taught from the very beginning that, especially in the industry that I started in, which was accountancy, you're going to deal with insolvencies and all sorts. You have to maintain this professional swan where you're consistent every day. Your your characteristics, the way you portray yourself to your business and to externals has to be consistent because when things aren't going right or aren't going to plan behind the scenes, you can't be the one that lets your mask slip and people guess. You have to be that kind of everything's fine face because you your temperature checked all the time by everybody around you and the slightest slip of that you you can give things away without need 
sort of without expecting to. And I think for me, I, I felt a little bit like having this happen to me and ha it was quite public that it happened because my whole work team knew I was out of the business for a period of time. It's quite obvious that something had happened. It, it was, it was a little bit vulnerable, but there mm. just wasn't any expectation from Selfridges at all for you to explain yourself. And that must have made it easier. Yeah, it definitely did. Yeah, definitely did. Yeah, cool. Amazing. Thanks. <laughs> well, I, th I mean, I think that everybody should be more open about their mental health. I suppose it's down to authenticity. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. If we focus on the kind of the more sort of recent part of your career, you know, with your current employer and Selfridges mm. previously, you know, you've got some quite big names in the mix here. Yeah. Um, and I can imagine for a lot of PAs and EAs, it's easy to get swept, or anybody actually, not just PAs or EAs, but anybody who's going for an interview with a big brand or a well-known name, whether it's a private individual, whether it's a big corporate, it would be quite easy to get swept up in the kind of, um, I suppose, the excitement in what that means. Yeah. And I can imagine for some people that might impact their ability to decide, okay, is this actually the right job for me? Yeah. So if you look back at the your experience so far, not just working with some big names, but also the interview process that you've been through, for anybody else going through that or anybody else who might be going through that or wants to go through that, what do you think is really important to keep top of mind when you're going for those interviews so that you don't get you know, caught up in the rush of, what does it mean to work for Prada or for <laughs> Selfridges or for Richard Branson? You know, What's important? You, you've got to want to do it. You, ultimately, I... I think it's really, like you say, it's really, really easy to get swept up and think, oh my God, this is huge. Imagine when I tell people, imagine when it goes on LinkedIn, imagine when it's on my CV and I can always say I was there. It's very, very easy to get swept up with that. But you have to work there. And if you don't like either your boss, the company ethics or anything like that, you, one, you're not gonna last and two, you're not gonna be that happy every day. And I think it de very much depends what you want, but I think most of us want to be happy at work because we spend a lot of time there. And I think you have to, when you're, f for me especially, when I've had those interviews, I have carefully considered, do I want to, can I see myself working for this person every day for them to be a very big part of my life and my world and if the answer is no, in your deepest fears, it's no, you cannot take that role. It would not be for your best interest at all. And that's gonna be very hard if actually you're getting swept up with it. It's very hard to be honest with yourself, but it's far better to sort of realize that in the interview stage or when you're at offer stage than it is once you've got the job and you're in it and then you're like, now what? We've all I've got been to do there. it. We? We've I've all heard there. horror stories. I think I it's stories. all about responsibility, I think, of asking the right questions as well, isn't it? And understanding yeah. values, what's coming up in the yeah. business, where can you create impact in the next six months? How do they support your learning and development? What are the interests of your boss outside of work? Yeah. You know, all of those things. You could be working for anyone, ultimately, mm. it doesn't really matter. But it's making sure that you have all of those bases covered, yeah. as you said, so you know whether or not this is the right job for you. It's not about whether it's the right company. No. It's about whether it's the right job. I think there's there's a phrase I've heard a lot, which is you need to interview them as much as they're interviewing you. Mm -hmm. And that's so Absolutely. true. It's so true. You really do. You need to get out of them what they're going to give to you. And it's not just a, a package. Yeah. It's more than that. You you as a as an assistant, whether it's a PA, an EA, a chief of staff, that human being or several human beings are part of your world and it does bleed into your personal life because that's kind of the nature of the role. So if you are working for a company or a person that doesn't give you that feeling of, yeah, I'm comfortable with this, you shouldn't be doing it. Absolutely. 
I love that advice. <laughs> I think more people should really, really harness that and take that on board as well. Because as you yeah. said, and as you know, we've just spoken about, it's so easy to get swept up yeah. in things. But ultimately, you don't want to be jumping around, do you? You want to no. be somewhere for a while. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about strategy. Because yeah. you describe yourself as a strategic thinker. Yeah. Strategic thinker. <laughs> I, can't, I can't always say get that word out properly. Strategic mm. thinker. So in your own words, mm. as an EA, what is a strategic thinker? To me, and I think this is... I, I've definitely heard this from other people. Um, it's as simple as being aware of the impact in a broader sense. So the impact of a decision, the impact of an action, anything like that. It's it's making sure that you know all of the potential impacts in the bigger picture. And it's very easy to take action in the moment. I've done it in, in my early career. You take action in the moment for what you think is the best action. Um, then you very quickly realize, oh no, that had an impact over there and I didn't see that coming. And actually, if you took a step back and just paused, I'm going to name check one of my EA girls because she is queen of the phrases. A girl I work with called Stacy, who's amazing and very insightful. She always says to me that she learned this from another EA. And that is, she. I, th I think she said the EA or she had a post-it on her desk that said, stop. And it was literally as simple as that. And I was like, that is mind blowing. Stop and think about it. You don't have to act there and then. And so often as assistants, we just go, I've been asked to do that. I need to do it as fast as I possibly can. To be strategic, you do need to stop. And if you stop, you can then step back and go, okay, if I do this, how does it impact that person? How does it impact that piece of work? How does it impact the view of our business to the customer, public, whatever? That is strategic thinking to me. And when you do that, you don't always get it right at all. I am definitely not perfect at it. And I don't think anybody is, but you have a half decent chance of not making a bad call in that moment. And because you're often supporting and advising your person, they have a half decent chance of making the right decisions too, because they are at the level that they work at, they're not always gonna see the granular detail. We quite often are. So actually informing them of the thing that's happened over here that might impact the thing over here, is actually really important. And um, without that, th you're not working strategically and you're not gonna get the best outcomes. Do you think that is a key skill that separates a good EA from a great EA? I think so. I think that I always come back to, I cannot do my job without a very large team around me. I I need people that can help me when visitors come into the building. I need help with, I might have to reach out to organizers and say, I need a venue for whatever it might be. You need those relationships, so, they're so key. And I've always been of the mindset that, and I said this earlier, if you have really strong and really good relationships from the top of the business to the bottom, you can't go far wrong because you'll always know somebody who can help you do the thing that you're trying to do. And it's not about using people as in a negative way, it's about using your connections in a positive way because actually you aren't the expert, you are the person that finds the experts to help you do the things that are impossible. And if you have relationships, you will always know where to turn to get those jobs done. Always. 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 Okay, well last question. <laughs> If you were to look back at your career so far, which is probably one of the most exciting careers that I think <laughs> I, we've had so far on this show, everybody's been fantastic. But in season two, I go, I still go back to what I said earlier. I think you are one of the most involved, passionate EAs that kind of gets, you know, that, that knows about everything in the organization and wants to know everything in the organization. If you were gonna go back to day one, at Intercell, mm -hmm. in your £8,000 office junior <laughs> role, yeah. and you were going to give yourself one piece of advice, what would that be? Um, there's, there's probably two. In that role, in probably my first ever appraisal, 
my boss said something to me and then stuck it on a post-it and put it on my screen. I like this post-it thing. <laughs> going on I love post-its. <laughs> they're, they're great until the wind flies through the window and then they're all gone everywhere. Um, he said to me, consistency is key. It was one of the best pieces of advice I'd ever got. And it's, it, it's true of all aspects, but I think particularly how you behave how you come across it kind of needs to be consistent otherwise people don't know what they're walking into and actually you are you need to be that consistent for me that's important um so I think that and I think the other thing is step back and look at the bigger picture and I definitely didn't do that at the start of my career because I didn't know that was what I needed to do but that was super important um probably three bits make friends with everyone be a good human be kind do not be somebody who uses another human and then discards them. Be a person that uses people and then make sure you return the favor and you're good to people and you help them where you can. And lastly, because I've got about nine now. <laughs> just keep, I'm thinking, just I'm just keep going. going. Oh, I've got another. Keep going, keep going. Probably the biggest thing for me personally has been say yes. Just say yes. Not necessarily to everything you're asked because I think you drown, but and, and no way you need to say no to things. Or this sounds like a comfort zone time. thing, though. Say yes, like you yeah. said yes to this. Say yes, exactly. <laughs> Step out of your comfort zone. Say yes to things you never know where they're going to lead. You never know what experience you're going to have. If you say no, you will never have that experience. You'll only have that one. If you say yes, who knows what might happen over here? Thank you. Thanks, Kat. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all of our future episodes. And if you're looking for a place to focus on your personal and professional development, we have a place in the assistant room membership with your name on it. Head to our website for more information on how to sign up and become part of our award-winning online global community for assistance everywhere.